Uh, so it is my pleasure to, to welcome you tonight. It's really great to see uh, a, a nice big crowd uh, and also to introduce uh, the woman behind this panel, uh, B. Ruby Rich, uh, who has... <clears throat> Who has uh, who's done an, I think a really amazing job pulling together uh, pulling this together uh, in just a couple of weeks. Um, this seems like a, a really necessary event. Um, I think we we've in the past it's been a very difficult month I think for many people uh, and uh, a very confusing and overwhelming time. And I think uh, a lot of us have been wondering uh, and also talking amongst ourselves about what we can actually do uh, and what we might look to uh, as sort of past models uh, and, and I think a question that those of us who work in film and the arts have been asking ourselves a lot is what resistance might look like uh, today and I think uh, there's, uh, Ruby has done an incredible job pulling together uh, some uh, really illustrious panelists uh, who I think will have some very interesting things to say about this. Uh, Ruby, as you know, is a critic uh, and scholar, um, professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, currently the editor of Film Quarterly. Uh, and so to introduce uh, the panelists that she has put together, I'll hand it over to Ruby Rich. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, thank you all so much for coming out here in support of this crazy idea and crazy event. Um, and my biggest thanks, of course, to these panelists, who, uh, most of whom I do not know and I'm only meeting tonight, and who really responded to the urgency of this moment and the chance to speak with this group uh, gathered here today, and for all of us to try to figure out together um, where to look in order to figure out what to do next. And um, we're, I'm bringing the panelists up in two batches. This is the first half of the eight panelists that we have here assembled, and you should have a program that uh, lists everyone. Um, if you don't, they're floating around. There's some over there. Uh, there are also issues of Film Quarterly over there. If you don't have one, pick one up on the way out just so you can see uh, what sort of universe you're part of. Um, this is billed as an urgent conversation about histories and futures of film, of television, um, web media, representational strategies. What have people done in the past? What are people doing right now? And what on earth are we supposed to do now in the future going forward? And the idea is to think of this as a kind of laboratory of ideas, suggestions, clues. Um, we have here people from many different arenas whose research uh, is in many different directions. And um, what we're going to do tonight is speak at very short length. Everyone is speaking for 10 minutes only. Um, first, these four. Next, our other four panelists who are hiding over there in the wings, uh, waiting their turn. Uh, and then everyone will be up here um, together uh, to begin a dialogue with each other and with you. So um, uh, I don't want to use up too much time with introductions. Uh, Regina Longo, the associate editor of Film Quarterly, who's over there on the side, has put together a PowerPoint with all of the bios. So I'm not going to introduce anyone at great length merely to let you know who is who before they speak. And it should be no surprise that the person that I've asked to speak first um, is uh, Walter Bernstein, uh, the man who has lived through earlier epics and lived to tell the tale, earlier eras of repression, uh, survived the blacklist, wrote about it, wrote a screenplay about it at the front, um, and uh, is gonna tell us a few things about what went on then, what could go on now, and uh, what he thinks you should be concerned with or um, paying attention to, okay? Um, I think we have a traveling mic, is that true? No, right here, very good. Walter, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I can talk about with any kind of authority is survival, uh, really. Uh, that's what it was all about primarily. Uh, what were the stratagems you used for survival? And survival was, the necessity for surviving was, was very real because the oppression was very real. I mean, this was a period in which uh, <clears throat> uh, the enemy 
in this case was communism. Uh, the enemy was anybody on the left, basically. Uh, we were a country, we were, we are a country in, in which every once in a while we feel the need or, <clears throat> or get the need for a, uh, an external enemy, in which case we throw civil liberties out the window and go chasing afterwards. Today it's terrorism, it's Muslims. Uh, in my day, it, uh, it was communism. And if you were suspected in any kind of way of uh, not even communist sympathies, but uh, in any kind of leftist activity, uh, you were blacklisted. It was as simple as that, basically. You know, if you joined any kind of organization or your name was on any petition, uh, let alone if you had written or belonged to organizations <clears throat> that were considered uh, on the left, you were, you were blacklisted. Uh, and if you wanted to get out of it, if you wanted to clear yourself, you had to name names. That also was very simple. It didn't matter if you went and did a mea culpa and said, oh, no, I hate communism. They're all very nasty people. And uh, uh, I don't want anything to do with them. That was all well and good, but still you had to name names. Uh, and if you didn't, you were blacklisted. Uh, in my case, that lasted about 10 years. We have frequent visits from the FBI, uh, who would go through my garbage, actually, looking for what, uh, any incriminating uh, yogurts or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and they would visit two or three times a month, very polite, you know, we'd like to talk to you. Well, I have nothing to say to you, thank you very much. But the fear was there because they always knew where you were. They would stop me coming out of the subway. They would stop me getting on a bus, getting home, coming out of a movie theater. Uh, always very polite and always very scary. Uh, but I'm here. Uh, uh, I survived that, uh, that period and one of the reasons Maybe the main reason uh, that I did was that we, the blacklisted people, for the, for the most part, came together. Uh, there was a generosity among them that perhaps came out of the fact that we were all in the same boat. But whatever it was, uh, we met, we helped each other. We loaned, if any of us had any money, we would lend it if it were necessary. And I think that in today's period also, uh, it's, it's mandatory really uh, to find groups to be together. We laughed a lot, strangely. You know, I always felt it was kind of the, the hilarity of doom. Uh, but uh, uh, it was a saving thing in a, in a period of, of when people lost their job, they were ostracized. Uh, you would feel somebody that you knew was coming toward you in the street for a moment or more, feel, were they gonna stop and say hello? Were they gonna cross the street to avoid you? As m many people did. Uh, it was a bad, bad period, really. We haven't come to that yet. It's down the road somewhere, I think. Uh, and, if you were able to work, the writers uh, were much luckier than, say, the directors or the actors. 
happy. They had to show their face. Uh, and we didn't. We could get people to represent us. We could get fronts. Uh, and so my survival depended on that to a great extent. But we helped each other. And I, you know, I can't stress that uh, too much, the need to, the need to come together. Uh, and also the need to collect victories, as many as you can, as small as you can, if necessary. It doesn't matter the size. But you have to show another face, really. Uh, and when I say we laughed, we laughed a lot. We had parties. Uh, we behaved like ordinary people. And that's important. It, it is so easy, it is so easy to get, dis to get discouraged and to realize that at the moment you don't have much power, if any, really. They have the power. And you have to acknowledge that, you have to deal with that, you have to realize what your true position is and not kid yourself. You cannot confuse words with actions, really. It's the action that counts. It's the doing of whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be big. It can be very small. But if it's there, you'll survive. And you'll survive well. Walter, why do you think they went after um, Hollywood or the film industry? Why do you think they went after writers? Did they really think that screenwriting, was that dangerous? And should people here hope it could be dangerous again? <laughs> yeah, no. No, I, they, they went after the entertainment industry uh, to get their name in the papers. That was the, the reason. We were very small fry as far as, they weren't after us, they were after the left wing of the labor movement. Uh, they were after uh, the State Department. Those were the big things that they were after. We were just a, you know, if you could get in, uh, in the newspapers with the, the names of stars or something like that, it gave them, it gave them publicity. Uh, and they didn't go after writers any more than they went after actors and directors. Uh, and uh, actually, the producers didn't, didn't want a blacklist. They wanted a labor pool that was as big as they could possibly make it. Uh, and they tried very hard at the beginning to, to keep the, I know the writers, certainly, the, uh, the producers, the executives like Daryl Zanuck, for example. Uh, uh, they, you know, they didn't care if anyone was a communist or anything else, as long as they did the job for them. Uh, my first job in Hollywood many years ago, uh, I was in the office of the director I was working for, and uh, a man came, we were moving furniture for some reason, and uh, a man came to the door, <coughs> and it was Harry Cohn, who was the man who ran and owned the studio, really. Uh, you know, and he uh, watched us what we were doing, and he said to the director, you know, is, it, is this one of your commie writers from New York? You know, and the director said yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, Cohn just nodded, went ahead with what he was doing. He didn't care, you know. If I didn't do the work, or he didn't like the work, or he didn't like me for how I looked, uh, that was what, uh, but if they were forced, they were forced by the government, they were forced by uh, right-wing organizations, picketing the theaters, uh, but uh, they didn't care much about us except as, pub as publicity, basically. Thanks, thanks Walter. I'm gonna change gears, I'm gonna ask, uh, we're gonna hear now from Ruth ben Giat. Uh, who's been studying Italian fascism and cinema, um, going back to Mussolini, back to Berlusconi, 
and might have a few things uh, to say of uh, immediate relevance right now. Um, Ruth? Thank you. Uh, is this, this is on? Yes. Great. Is it? Can you hear? Is it on? Yeah. Great. So, yeah, and I'm, um, uh, my thoughts are less about right now how to resist than um, how to help us understand what is standing in front of us because that is the first step to being able to do something to understand what you are dealing with. And there is still a lot of denial um, and failure to comprehend. Um, so, and I'm speaking as a scholar of fascism, but also as someone who covered the presidential election for CNN.com for the last 18 months, specializing in Donald Trump. And these things are intertwined. So th the first time I saw Donald Trump, uh, not in person, but I saw him at a rally, uh, saw him performing as a politician, my heart sank and I was filled with dread um, because it was deeply familiar to me. And so I want to just touch on a few things that were familiar to me. Um, the chief one was the way he started from the very beginning cultivating a kind of bond with his um, followers that was based on his person and not on a party and not on allegiance to principles. He doesn't give a whit about the GOP is my humble opinion. And he wants this kind of uh, submission to his person quite beyond any party and beyond any particular principle. And this is a kind of emotional bond that he forges, and it's un unfortunate he's been so successful, and he has his loyalty oath and his salute. He has these kind of political theater rituals. Because from what I've learned studying for many years, once these bonds are formed, it's very hard for them to be broken. Um, and it took a war for Mussolini, it took the uh, Eurozone crisis for Berlusconi, something kind of big has to happen. Um, so another thing is how these people use visual culture, how they use images. And, and Trump is incredibly you know, savvy at uh, knowing how words and images interact. And um, so he read the market well. He concocted a political project that was founded on a politics of resentment to Obama, to foreigners. Um, and he, he began to retweet uh, racist images. And the first time I saw this kind of very, they're very, they were from the right wing and they were very complicated, you know, assemblages of word and text. Uh, and he started retweeting these things, and the first time I saw one, I stopped dead in my tracks, and I rushed, I ran through Washington Square Park home to write an op-ed because I realized that this was very dangerous, because it was very compelling what it was doing for, for the viewer. So, as you well know, he, he started, you know, circulating kind of messages against African Americans, Hispanics, um, uh, circulating very powerful anti-Semitic symbols. And also, he's a visual guy. And so even his speeches are full of these very compelling and resonant images like walls and swamps and lawless inner cities. And, and these, these are very, um, they, these take hold of people. And so it's not surprising that these same images have been used by dictators in the past. And so Mussolini, one of his main slogans was drain the swamps. Mm -hmm. And my first book on fascism, the whole, the, basically the whole argument of my first book, which was written many years ago, was um, about this kind of concept of reclamation. It was called bonifica in Italian, that you were gonna drain the swamps, first physical swamps, and then get rid of all the undesirables and extend it to Jews and you know, Slavs and everyone else. So, so these things recur, and there are a lot of continuities. Um, Regina, can you put up the image of the, the guy? Is okay, good. So the other area um, is what I'm calling an aesthetics of menace. And its anchor is the body of the leader and who dominates any space or any frame that he's in. 
and, and this is very important, and carries in him the potential for violence. That's where the menace comes in. So this is uh, not Mussolini, but this is Fosco Giacchetti, who was kind of one of the very most popular film actors in fascist Italy, and he specialized in these military and empire films. And the way he ha was holding his hands, uh, this was Mussolini's favorite position, and it was replicated through all his kind of proxies throughout um, you know, the intermedia circuits of fascism. And so this, from this body, these kinds of bodies emanate a very intimidating speech. They're aggressive, right? And so, um, you know, Trump is the styling himself in this manner. So one of the watersheds of the campaign um, was when Trump said, and he even gave a helpful little, um, you know, gesture, that he could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot people and no one, he wouldn't lose any followers. And, and this was a form of testing that these guys do and he was testing the political class more than even the populace to see what they were gonna do and what their tolerance was for violence. So, but the, the anchor of this aesthetics of menace is, the, is this kind of body. And this body multiplies. So these, these guys like to um, you know, replicate themselves. And so you have proxies, you have surrogates. And so that's why I'm not showing Mussolini, I'm showing one of his many stand-ins across the media. And so you can wake up one day and find that you have an administration that is full of tough men. Uh, we have an, a record number of generals who he would like to appoint. And among the civilians, there's an unusually high number of uh, men who have been accused of domestic violence or sexual assault. And I had to revise my number up one because and, and it, I think it's been confirmed, I heard today, um, he would like to nominate Roger Isles of Fox News for uh, the position of Under Secretary of Public Diplomacy, which <laughs> I, I thought this was from The Onion, but uh, alas, it is not. So Regina, can you bring up the, the second image of the hovering, the, the, the other one, the one that you so ably, can you do the, Yes, I'd like the other one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so this, this kind of um, provocation and intimidation, uh, this is the, from the, the presidential debate that left so many men and women feeling sick to their stomach. And so you see he's composed, but it's kind of the calm before the storm. And it's very important that we knew by then about some of his physical and other uh, alleged, you know, uh, aggressions to women, and the key thing is that he knew that we knew, right? So we were already on the defensive as we watched Clinton, and, and we, we could feel that, that he was in this mode, and this is how the aesthetic of menace operates, that he knows that we know, and so they, in one man way, they like to hide what they've done, but they also don't mind if it comes out if they're in a position to start you know, asserting themselves and intimidating, in this case, an entire country. And so you can go to the last slide. And so Trump also knows that we'll be encouraged to forget. And so here we have him uh, at the um, triumphant, at the convention, emerging from the fog. He is a man with no past. He is a mere silhouette upon which we can project our fantasies. And so this is Trump telling us that if he wins, we will have to cleanse all knowledge of his swampy past, all of his swamps, right? And this happens, uh, this was familiar to me from my study of fascist visual culture because the male leads of fascist films and one of the plot lines is that you have to be reclaimed, you have to be rehabilitated. So a lot of them have blackouts. They faint, which seems odd in this kind of tough guy. But so they cleanse themselves and then they can be the perfect fascist subject. So it's a memory loss. Or they have a battle scene and then the screen is flooded with sand or with fog so th the reader, the, the viewer is supposed to kind of realize that the violence is left and the glamour remains. And so we can go back to the, these kind of men and the spectacle of them. So if we're not careful, you know, this fog will come to cloud our own minds. There'll be a lot of pressure to forget uh, the sexual assault, to forget um, the certain parts of the racism, to forget all kinds of things. And then we can enter into this quietude and passivity, which is what these rulers want. So I think our task is to keep our minds clear and our eyes open and 
and keep that fog at bay at, and, and keep present the image bank that they themselves provide to us. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much um, for that, um, Ruth. Um, I I'm going to I'm just moving quickly through this so that we can make the most use of our time here. Uh, Susana de Sousa Diaz has come has flown in from Lisbon to sp talk with us and who's been working uh, throughout her career on the archives from the Salazar dictatorship and um, is going to share some of her knowledge and her advice with us. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, um, I would like to, to, to start by explaining very briefly what my work is, is about and of course its connections to the current moment we are living. Uh, the main theme of my work is the Portuguese dictatorship. It's a very special dictatorship because in the context of the 20th century, because it was the longest one in Western Europe, it lasted for 48 years and it came to an end through a revolution a wonderful revolution, Carnation Revolution, in 1974. And I started to work on this subject, firstly, because over the last two decades, I had been assisting a kind of oblivion, oblivion regarding this period. An oblivion that obfuscates the violence against the people, the violence of daily life, the violence in the former colonies, but also obfuscates what was the fight of the people against the, the regime. And even more problematic was that um, while the years went passing by, the policies and actions of the dictator and of the regime had simply been what wa whitewashed. And this was done not only by practical actions, but also uh, done by historical and historical revisionism uh, regarding this period. So, as a result of the generalized lack of memory and the con constant attempts to whitewash the past, people do forget that many of the rights of the working population, of the working people, had been obtained due to active facts during the dictatorship, like the working of eight hours per day, and at the same time, this lack of memory is fooled by the banalization of the dictatorship through the media. Uh, so we can see a kind of a, of a farce, um, a kind of theatralization of memory and uh, the past as something light for easy consumption. So my work uh, doesn't try try to go to the past, trying to find some truth in it. On the contrary, it tries to see how the past arrives to the present by paying attention to the movements and counter-movements of images and, and sounds. So my idea is to work about the present, searching in the blanks, the lacunia, the non-sayings, and brushing history against the grain, like Walter Benjamin says, in this thesis of history. And so I, I brought two images. I'm going to skip the, the first one. Um, so the first one, it's a kind of an audience images that I'm working with. The second one is um, a kind of opposite ima image from the first one. It's an image of resistance. And it's taken from my film 48, a film made with mugshots and voice over by former political prisoners. It's a film that deals with oppression and torture, themes that are absolutely present in our times. If torture returns uh, with the war of Iraq, it became now very relevant because uh, of the Donald Trump's treat to bring it back again. Um, Yervan Giannikian and Angela Ricciolucchi, two Italian uh, filmmakers, have a sentence in one of his films from 2013, that I really want to bring for this discussion. They say that every era has its, its fascism. And this sentence can lead us to the paradox of the present, the paradoxes of the current times. All of us are consuming day by day an enormous amount of information. But at the same time, I think we experience a kind of deficit of memory, at last of a certain type 
of memory. And we have so many images from the past, so many sounds, but at the same time, everything seems to blur in the, in the kind of presence. It's, uh, there is a title, there is a film of Alexander Kluge, The Hus Assault of the Present on the Rest of Time. And I think we are living in a kind of continuous present. And I think in this context, we have to think about the uses of history and memory. And nowadays, we are assisting to a conflict regarding the representations of the recent past. And these are essential representations to legitimize the politics and ideologies of the present. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the defeat of the socialism, and after the, the historical victor victory of the global globalized capitalism, a new conservative neoliberal order has been spreading violently around the globe. And suddenly, there was a, a, an ideological revision of history that promotes a criminalization of socialism and a criminalization of the whole idea of revolution. Uh, at the same time, during the, 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 the last years, we assisted to the almost disappearance of the word fascism. Now it's returning. And this is a, a very good thing, because we really need this concept to think of the present. So, uh, but at the same time that the word fascism was disappearing, okay, oh, fascism, oh, no, it's Mussolini, oh, fa the Portuguese dictatorship, no, it's not fascist, it's so Lazarus. So it was, people, historians were putting aside the word, and at the same time, this made that the, the anti-fascism was also almost criminalized. Crimin crimin criminalized. 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 Uh, not only the anti-fascism, but also the fights against totalitarian or to authoritarian regimes. Both movements are connected. Uh, but worst of is, is that this new order kills the entire revolutionary tradition that came back from the days of the French Revolution, and uh, while promoting exclusively one political and social order. So this is a kind of uh, neoliberal order that crushes everything that promises a, a different world. And this is why, the reason why I brought the, the third image. It's an image of Sakalotos, and um, so, uh, the government of Greece was crushed by the power uh, that, that had the government. Actually, this, this was taken in the moment where the discussions about the bailout was really uh, in the in the um, oh in the most uh, intense moment, and uh, the government of Greece had the power of a referendum to refuse the bailout, and they didn't manage to do this that. So. This is an image full of pathos, and for me, this is an icon of defeat. I myself felt defeated when this happened, so we put so much hope into the Greeks to stand up against this neoliberal power, and they did not succeed. Uh, Alan Badiou, the French philosopher, stresses uh, an important point about this victory of the globalized capitalism. He, said that, he says that the victory is not only an objective victory. Uh, it's on, not only in the domain of this objectiveness, but it's a sub subjectivity question as well. So this is the greatest victory of capitalism, that people are convinced that there is no other way. So in this world marked by the offensive uh, converse conservative revisionism, by the end of the utopias for the future, by a crisis of transmission of experience. For me, it's paramount to work on several aspects of memory and to think about its uses, but not about the strong memories. I mean, the, the, the memories like, say, Enzo Traverso, the, the Italian historian, the official memories nurtured by institutions, nurtured by the states, but the underground memories, the hidden memories, the repressed memories, the forbidden memories. 
And so my field of action, it's these weak memories. And well, finally talking about Trump, uh, I heard many people saying that they couldn't foresee what was coming. I didn't, <laughs> I think nobody saw this. Uh, this is unthinkable, uh, but as Badiou also says, to say I don't understand is a defeat. So we cannot be prisoners by the emotions, by the negative affects. Uh, we have not only to resist, but to act. And this came to what Walter Benstein said. It's not, we, we have not, uh, not confusing words with actions. We have to, we have to act. And uh, Trump says, but you, it's a figure of a new kind of fascism, a fascism of the democratic times. It's a kind of a democratic fascism, which is a paradox in itself. It's inside and outside of the system. But I would say that um, we live strange moments, strange democratic moments. We are in an era of the deconsolidation of democracy. It's a recent article that was written about this. So Trump is here, Marine Le Pen is around the corner, the Scandinavian uh, guys are there, uh, and all around the world, Erdogan, Duterte. So everyone should resist and create something uh, to go, well, from pathos to practice, or to be in this dialectic between pathos and practice. And we have to resist and act with whatever we have at hand. And this brings me to the last image I brought. And this is actually the reason why I brought this image. It's a photo that is exposed in an exhibition called Sulevma Uprisings. It's organized by Didi Uberman, and I, I went there three days ago. It's in Paris. And I brought here this image because it draws a kind of a, a gesture. It is a photo taken in 1977. It's the people from Guernica paying a tribute to a memory, to a fight, to a reproduction of Picasso's Guernica painted by the students. And for me, it's a very beautiful image. Art, memory, transmission, simplicity and complexity. So it's the raising up of a gesture. And it's a little bit like Alderlin wrote in his famous poem, Patmos, where there is danger, a rescuing element grows as well. So thank you so much, Sam. <laughs> and, thanks, and thanks for this fabulous image also. Um, I want to just move along now to hear from Natalia Brizuela, who's joined us, who flew out from Berkeley uh, on a red eye to be here, and originally from Argentina, and is um, coming to share with us some of her perspectives. Yep. Thank you. Um, so there's something that I've been thinking about for a while and teaching in many of my classes, which is, is it possible for there to be a political cinema today like there was in the 1960s and 70s, um, and where Latin America played such a crucial uh, role in that articulation in the 60s and 70s and what has happened to it. So that's, you know, th th those are questions that I'm grappling with in a book I'm writing and questions that I grapple with in a number of the work that I do. And so that's why I wanted to start with a, an image of um, Glauber Rocha, the Brazilian filmmaker, right, one of these uh, kind of mystic figures from the 1960s and 70s, who, if you might have seen the film or not, in this 1970 film by the Zigavertov Collective, right, composed, among others, of uh, Jean-Luc Godard and Jean-Pierre Gorin, they asked Glauber Rocha, who had already made most of his best-known films, to impersonate political cinema. And so this woman, this pregnant European woman, comes up to him and asks him, like, oh, what's the direction to political cinema? She's like out there searching, right? She's pregnant. She's a pregnant woman. And he goes, well, over there to my right is, you know, the cinema of adventure. And over there to the left is the cinema of the third world, which is uh, marvelous, it's dangerous, it's divine. Um, 
and it's clearly where he's, you know, he keeps repeating like in a mantra. And so she's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go that direction. She goes and she walks off the road for like two seconds and then it's like, oh, okay, no, I'm not going there. Okay, so she comes back. She's like, this is too complicated. I'm gonna go the other road, right? And off she goes. And this film signals the moment of kind of the closure of those uh, film aesthetics and film movement around, you know, the belief that film, starting from the Russian Revolution to that moment, film could change the world. Film had a place to play in changing the world. So that's kind of what I keep asking um, in today's world, right? Um, so along, I just wanted to share with you a couple of the things that I've been thinking about in the Latin American and um, also Luso-Hispanic context, because that's the field that I work on. I mean, if I were to say one filmmaker, one of maybe two or three filmmakers that you must watch their films, it is Susana's films. Uh, you must watch her films because there is so much to learn in the strategies she had she has offered us. Um, but I, I wanted to, I had, as I was looking over things that have come out of Latin America recently, I, I realized that there were two or three terms that kept um, emerging, and one was life, the, the search for life, for survival, to go back to what Walter was saying at the beginning, strategies for the survival of life in today's world, um, something that uh, I know in the US is now becoming a, a pressing issue, but in places like Latin America, we've been thinking about that for a very long time, um, <laughs> um, or in places like Portugal or Spain, right? This is what the 20th century has been like for us on almost a daily basis. So along with life, there was this other term, which is live, live streaming, which has become, I mean, it's crazy, right? Uh, uh, life, live, and the collective, right? As three strategies and concepts and movements that keep coming up in a lot of media and film practices that I think are the most interesting today. Um, when I say live, I am thinking particularly of work, like for example, the, there's a Brazilian independent media collective that has emerged um, in the last five years, most prominently in 2013, with the massive protests uh, at that moment around the, uh, against the rise of the fair, uh, public transportation fair in Sao Paulo. Um, and that collect, it's a collective and it's called Ninja Media. And I really urge you to look it up. They emerge, they're basically uh, image based. They, they live stream, they don't have a, a platform. They tweet, they Facebook, um, they YouTube and everything is live streamed. And that changed, it started in 2011 really and that changed radically um, in, a place like Brazil, which is similar to a place, say, like Mexico, where the media conglomerates are uh, the most powerful industries in the world, uh, in those countries owned by the richest people in those countries that also control politics, economics, cultural life. And so these co this collective emerged um, as, as an alternative, uh, and at any given moment uh, to today, they have 250,000 viewers on, hooked on all the time, and that's amazing. And the stress there is about the, the live streaming, right? And what they are live streaming is the life of people who have never had the right or the possibility of entering into the field of representation. So there's also, you know, so there's a, on the one hand that, that a relationship between live and life. Um, there is, I also kept thinking of the work of an art, a multimedia artist like Nuno Ramos, who very recently a live streamed for 24 hours on YouTube and Facebook uh, the reading of the hundred, the names of the 111 prisoners that were murdered in 1992 in what is considered the biggest prison massacre uh, in Brazil uh, and in Latin America. And uh, Temer's government had just pardoned 
uh, all the guards, the 74 guards who had killed these 111 inmates, right? And so he live streamed just this nonstop reading by 24 different people, the names of, of, of these dead, kind of bringing them back, right? Um, so with this question of live streaming, I think the, the thing is that they go viral. And so to think of viral as a strategy um, today for life, right? Where, you know, viral is not, no longer a, a virus that poisons life, but a virus that poisons, poisons media. And that might be our only way of survival. And I think that in this country, there is still a need for collectives of that kind. Um, there has been a rising interest in alternative media, but it hasn't really kind of taken on. And alongside this use of like, you know, media practices in Latin America, uh, there's a part of me that really wants to still feel that m film as a medium, as that medium that we are used to seeing uh, on the screen in a darkened room has the power to do something to us in this tradition of a kind of high modernist aesthetic, right? Um, and that, that might be the part that I'm still grappling with, that I'm not sure, that I, maybe I'm wishing for, right? That I think the 1960s and 70s attempted, you know, kind of in, in the genealogy, again, that starts with, you know, Vertov and Eisenstein and the Russian Revolution and the thinking of film as changing consciousness. Um, but along those lines, I think that maybe one of the most important things to recuperate right now are works that help us deal with history in this age of amnesia, as Susanna was saying, right? And in that line, there are, I think, three filmmakers that are doing, in my opinion, my humble opinion from this part of the world that I know a little about is these three filmmakers, one of them is Susana, um, another one is another Portuguese filmmaker called uh, Pedro Costa. Um, and this film of his, Tarrafal, one of his five or six films, this is a very short film. Um, he has transformed the means of production. He works with the people that act in his films. He, they work with almost no money. Uh, they are people that used to live in a very uh, poor neighborhood of Lisbon that has now been uh, destroyed. And this particular film, Tarrafal, is about a, a wave of deportation that happened in uh, Portugal in 2006, 7, and 8, right? Where people were just kind of like being told, mainly people of African descent, like, go back home. But these are people that had li been born in in Portugal, um, and these are the films that uh, he has started making with them since 2002. So I think that because of his interest in colonialism um, and in questions of immigration and race, he might be someone that we can learn from a lot. And the last person, and that's just what I'm going to stop with, is uh, the last, is uh, Paz Encina, who's a, a filmmaker from, oh no, yeah, it's okay, from, I didn't have, okay, from <laughs> Paz Encina. Um, you're gonna be able to watch her films at MoMA in February. They're gonna screen her films. Um, from Paraguay, uh, she, Paraguay shares uncanny similarities with Portugal, uh, not a 48-year dictatorship, but a 35-year-long dictatorship. Um, and much like uh, Susana, she has been using film in a, in a way to kind of a archive the lives of people that a, have fallen into the oblivion during the long 20th century history of fascism. Thank you, thank you so much. We're switching out panelists here. They'll be back up here again to talk all together. But in the meantime, um, the, we started out with panelists talking about the past um, and a little bit about the present and now about the present and a little bit about the future. And so everybody else come on up here. And I'm just gonna say while they're settling in, um, I want to say there's a few seats here if anyone's tired of being on the stairs. Uh, there's some spaces. And also to say that I just read that uh, Gael Garcia Bernal, the actor, was just giving a talk and he said, well, Trump has the nuclear codes, but we have the cameras. And I thought, mm, okay, maybe. So we're 
we're here to see um, what, what, what other ways we can think about this and see if we can get a little bit further than that. So um, welcome to our brave next batch of panelists. I'm really thrilled with how this evening's going and hope you are. Um, I'm gonna start um, stage left, my right, uh, with Michael Boyce Gillespie, who's going to speak to us uh, from his um, CUNY perch, um, uh, looking at um, the films that he thinks we ought to be paying attention to right now. Michael, do you have a, a mic over there? Yes, okay. 10 minutes and I'll start timing for you. <laughs> No pressure, Ruby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone, for coming out. And so I'll just get into it, uh, thinking definitely about this issue of the present and thinking through th the lens of my own scholarship. So Fordism and the wages of capitalism, that was the plan. A lecture on Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times the week after the election. <laughs> keep it simple, keep it clear, keep it moving. But the more I tried to talk about labor, comedy, and reification, the more my heart went elsewhere. So I stopped and played the final scene from Chaplin's The Great Dictator. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite. It's still a riveting scene to watch, but I really didn't need to watch it to confirm my commitment to the fight ahead. In that moment in the classroom, I needed something that was equivalent to my post-election feelings. I needed a cinematic moment that brutally demonstrated what happens when the joke isn't funny anymore. I would like to discuss briefly the ways that the idea of black film has consequentially informed my sense of our moment and the resistant capacities that I argue for in the terms of film blackness. In other words, I would like to briefly map out ways that blackness is rendered not as truth or reflection of a social category, but as a critical art. Now more than ever, film blackness must be appreciated as a speculative staging of black visual and expressive culture, and the place of at times condescending readings of black film equals black people. In this precise moment, in the shadows of the fourth reconstruction to come, I don't want to hear about how cinema will change the world. I adore cinema, but I've never trusted it in those terms. What I want is a cinema that incites and disrupts, while also responsive to some kind of necessities of a politics of pleasure. What I want is a cinema devoted to the multitudes, intimacies, and intricacies of art, history, and culture. What I want is a cinema of affective encounters that might compel us to unlearn and do the work of resistance. So can we go to the next image? So one of those films for me that is doing this work, a film that I keep cycling back to, is Arthur Jaffa's film, Dreams Are Colder Than Death. And I would, <laughs> and I would, you def, I would, <laughs> amen. Uh, <laughs> and I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you go uptown to Gavin Brown Enterprises and see Love is the Message, the Message is Death. But for right now, let me talk a little bit about Arthur Jaffa's Dreams Are Colder Than Death. It is a film which richly demonstrates cinema's capacity to enact blackness, particularly blackness with regards to its magnitude and its potential. It's an experimental documentary that focuses on the meaning of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech 50 years later, and whether the goals and ambitions of the civil rights movement have been achieved. The film asks, does the dream live on? And if so, what has changed? It is a visual historiography of black thought, as the film sees with a productively agnostic impression of the idea of black history in progressive terms by considering the perception and conception of history in exquisitely visual and mosaic terms. 
Geographically speaking, the film is structured across the landscapes of Harlem, Brooklyn, Hotlanta, Mississippi, and Los Angeles. Its assembly of uncommon folk and specialists includes Hortense Spillers, Fred Moten, Kara Walker, Charles Burnett, Melvin Gibbs, Sadia Hartman, Flying Lotus, Nicole Fleetwood, Kathleen Cleaver, and Wengeshi Mutu. Together, this group of visual artists, revolutionaries, musicians, academics, filmmakers, and activists, and everyday citizens offer a kind of critical resistance to their own philosophical practices around black expressivity. But I want to briefly focus on a part of Fred Moten's appearance. In the final section of the film, his voice is paired with footage of him walking. And that is coupled with footage from a Trayvon Martin rally in Los Angeles. The slow motion movement of a mass protest devoted to a black boy coated by a hoodie, murdered and left to die in the rain with no shelter from the storm, becomes punctuated by Moton's commentary that includes the following. Quote, when you say that black people are just an effect of slavery, you raise the question, can black people be loved? Not desired, not wanted, not acquired, not lusted after. Can black people be loved? Can blackness be loved? So what I am saying is that I believe there is such a thing as blackness, and how it operates is that it is not an effect of horror. It survives horror and terror, but it is not an effect of these things. So, I, so it can be loved, and it has to be loved, and it should be defended." End quote. It is Moton's suggestion that blackness is always already an act of faith, which I still cycle through. As the film pivots away from this kind of narrative interrupted recycling of a selectively remembered sense of Dr. King's vision to something more dialogical, something around an issue of black praxis and freedom dreams. Can blackness be loved? Moton's question, an exquisite explanation for dreams are colder than death, resounds as a rhetorical call, a devotional affirmation, and an act of revolutionary hope. It is in these dynamic times, times that every morning when I sit on the subway train and I see, see something, say something, and realize it does not apply to hate crimes, that I have to constantly ask myself, can blackness be loved? Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Angela Zito is up next, who I especially wanted to hear from because of her work with Chinese independent documentary after the Tiananmen Square Massacre, and the work she's been doing looking at that. Angela. Thank you, Ruby. Um, at one time in the galaxy far, far away, uh, the authoritarian nightmare of communist China seemed far, far away. But now we are all growing closer. And so let us learn. Let us learn from the Chinese reaction to Tiananmen. Let us learn from their digital turn. And let us learn about archiving from them. In the fall of 1978, we people in the United States who study China have been given the advance word that come January, diplomatic relations would resume. By the following August of 1979, I found myself on a train north from Hong Kong starting a three-year stay for dissertation research in Beijing. I came with a camera, an Olympus OM-1, 35mm SLR, you know who you are out there, and a manual brother typewriter. Both of these examples of advanced communications technology had to be registered at the border, and I would be asked to produce the paperwork along with the objects when I departed for home lest I had left behind any of this possibly disruptive equipment in Chinese hands. Oh, the irony. Now this place that I have repeatedly visited and lived for more than 30 years builds a fair amount of the digital tech that litters everyone's landscape. Now, as usual, it does come down to us and our tools, tools which extend our eyes, our ears, and allow us to touch the world are important, but tools like cameras or the internet are not everything. To be sure, they are resources and even weapons in the struggle between people with vastly different senses of the world. And I don't mean Americans and Chinese here. <laughs> um, but the sense of the world matters more than the tools. Forward 10 years to Tiananmen in 1989, I watched it on American television, weeping. 
on that day. It is fair to say the world watched the limits of protest when the army arrives and opens fire. Certainly China lives with the draconian aftermath. There is no right of free public gathering in China pretty much at all these days. The aftermath of the terror of those Beijing nights had immediate results for filmmakers. They actually became so. On the one hand, I think people got depressed and developed a kind of nothing to lose attitude which led to a drift out of their careers in broadcast newsrooms by the trained folks who knew how to use cameras. Ten years in from my first 1979 entry in 1989, few had access to moving image cameras except those professionals. These excursions of escape from newsrooms with borrowed equipment uh, opened the independent documentary movement. And post Tiananmen filmmakers fanned out now in the 90s and armed themselves with smaller cameras and eventually DV. We must understand that these tools were happily taken up because they helped makers to pursue the things they had already wanted to see. All sorts of subjects to shoot in the territory beyond the state's gaze, the marginalized, the neglected, the overlooked, the willfully ignored, or the uncategorizable. On a, can I have the slide of the old woman, please? Yeah. Um, uh, a terribly intimate scale, this is a still from Starving Village, uh, the filmmaker Zhou Xiaoping's dying grandmother. Uh, they refused uh, to film within the state system of censorship and so had no distribution. They have often been criticized by Chinese with developed senses of national dignity for showing only misery and corruption, for airing national dirty laundry and pandering to foreign voyeuristic curiosity in film festivals. Yet their work has forever enlarged the map of social life in China, making visible and available for archiving people's lives heretofore neglected or prettified by mainstream media. So I mentioned archiving, and this brings up another and maybe even more important result of Tiananmen, the slowly dawning sense in China that after June 4th, the state would mount campaigns to wipe the memories of the killings. In fact, people began to realize a good deal of history was being forgotten. For as we know, there is no trauma that is not forgotten in the sense of already received and under process. And the real issue is remembering, giving new life in the bodies of the living. Memories may be past, but remembering is always an act in the present. In China, lost memory is profoundly generational, creating great gaps where affection and empathy can disappear. The trauma of the Great Famine, caused by bad policy, but blamed on the Russians in 1958 and 1960 belongs to dying grandparents. The Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 76, belongs to them, but also to their children, the parents, people too young to recall the terrible famine, but maybe people of sort of boomer age in an American terms. And today, what trauma does today's generation face? Surely nothing of this magnitude, but some of their elders worry that they will die of consumption, capitalist consumption, and die in ignorance. The filmmaker Hu Jie is dedicated to the work of history and archiving. He started his own life deeply embedded in state apparatuses, born in 1958 in Nanjing. He graduated from the Art College for the People's Liberation Army in oil painting. He was in the Army for 15 years. In 1992, he was given a Super 8 camera by a Japanese friend. <laughs> I'm still smuggling in the technology. And began bumming around the country, filming, turning to DV when he could. He did a stint with the state Xinhua News Agency as a reporter, but he was soon asked to leave. Who is legendary for being a brilliant filmmaker of tenacity who stays low to the ground, a single-minded maker well known to the local police? His first two films, Searching for the Soul of Lin Zhao and Though I Am Gone, are distributed in the United States, which is very rare for this kind of film, uh, uh, by Icarus and Degenerate, so I, it's one of the reasons I really wanted to mention them today. Uh, Lin Zhao is about a now famous young woman rightist who was imprisoned and later executed inside jail for refusing re-education. It is a terrible story that Hu brings to light through her prison writing, done in her own blood using hairpins and later recopied by her with a pen and through interviews with people who knew her and were still alive in the 90s. Though I am gone, if I could have, yes, there it is, right. Um, takes up the trauma of the Cultural Revolution in this 60-minute film, who receives the testimony in voice and film and bloody objects stored in a suitcase of Wang Jingyao. This is Wang. Wang was a photographer and carefully and obsessively documented the death by beating of his wife, 
Bian Zhongyun, the vice principal of a very prestigious secondary school in Beijing. She was murdered by her own students, becoming one of the first victims of the revolutionary violence that would engulf the entire nation. And so he is here documenting in this film the archivist uh, using his photos. Could I have the next slide? The, yeah, the, the, yes, that's it. This is a photo by Wang Jingyao of his children viewing the dead body of their mother. Some final thoughts. The Chinese state, no state, after the digital turn can ever control production in the age of video and non-linear kitchen sink editing of media. This is the much vaunted and not insignificant empowerment of the digital. I will quote Hu Jie on this. I think from a foreigner's point of view, it would be very sad if you made a film that could not be seen by your audience. But for me, it's normal, because after all, they don't allow you to make these films. The public media never makes or broadcasts these kinds of films. That is the reality I face. So the most important thing for me is to make the film, and to make a good film. And then the word will spread. This is the standard I set for myself. I don't have a way to distribute the films, so the only channel I have is to make a really good film. If it's good enough, the word will spread. If the film does not find an audience, I do not complain that it is banned. I criticize myself for not going, doing a good enough job. Hujia here heroically takes a lot upon himself. Not something most of us would do. And it is a terrible call to action, however. Indeed, China, China has tightened even further its laws just very recently concerning distribution and uh, exhibition. Every time we have shown these films at NYU at the Real China Film Biennial that I do there with a colleague, someone in the audience stands up and asks, but can people in China see these films? Is there any point in making them if Chinese audiences cannot see them? Again, I will give you Hu Jie. There is. Because if you don't go record it, these people will die and no one will know their stories. No one will ever know their stories. The government definitely won't tell their stories. The other point is that during this bitter era, this violent era, this most terrifying era, people still tried to reflect on what was happening. They weren't afraid to die. They died in secret. And we of succeeding generations don't know what heroes they were. I think it's a matter of morality. They died for us. If we don't know this, it is a tragedy. And when I look out at my audiences who inevitably ask this question, I really want to scream, this is not an ad, and the measure of media is not always how many people will view it in the shortest time frame, or how many clicks. Now the wonderful thing about Hu Jie's work is that the making of it creates its own network of enlivened engagement. The people he interviews, the ones who provide him with documents, the friends who encourage, the friends who archive for him, the other filmmakers with whom he collaborates. All of these are moments of necessary liveness. Like many things, a film is only sometimes an object. It strains to become a thing that can exist, to be circulated, and not decay with undue speed. But it is also much more. It is a pause in an ongoing and ensemble process of making, of social production, that takes a certain materialized form that can be heard and seen, portably carried, or email. An archive for the future that I think we must believe exists already in ourselves, as many, many people in China have already shown. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Imani Perry, who's come up from Philadelphia, to speak with us today and whose books and articles have really, really impressed me. Imani? Thank you. Um, so I, um, I want to start with two, uh, two formulations that have been circulating in my mind. One is a friend of mine, Ashan Crawley, keeps posting and is posted pretty consistently but more frequently since the election um, on social media, um, the two word sentence, make art. Um, as an imperative. And then the other is uh, a response that I had. I had, after the, on November 9th, I had a range of um, emotions um, and thoughts um, and sleepless nights. Um, and the one that actually um, kind of triggered anger for me was the recognition, the, re the realization that my mother, who's in her early 70s, who was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, um, had grown up in a white nationalist state and was being forced to live in one again. 
um, and also a police state. Um, we think about um, George Wallace and Bull Connor. Um, um, and it was a recognition that whatever um, this, in this particular moment also, is that whatever this terror that Trumpism um, has triggered um, is actually not new. Um, it's a repetition. Uh, and in this immediate cycle, I think, for black Americans actually began in earnest in 2014, um, not this fall. Uh, so the phenomenon of, of uh, police officers killing unarmed um, African Americans was not new. It's so old that in my archival research I see um, discussions of it in newspapers in the 1930s, right? Even the very origin of, of policing in this country is racialized in that sense. Um, but something distinct happened in August of 2014 um, in Ferguson, and that in response to the killing of Mike Brown, there's a stance on the part of citizens there, refusal to accept the regularity of the procedure of summary execution and summary judgment in the street without process, without courts, without deliberation. Um, not that those afford any particular security, um, but they are sort of principles that we are supposed to hold. And so the residents of Ferguson refused the order of business, and it was then that the military weaponry came out. Um, uh, and the use of digital media following that um, moment allowed for networks of communication to travel that allowed us to tell the repetition, to share the repetition of this story weekly and sometimes daily, a harrowing repetition um, of the fact that minor infractions might lead to one's death. Um, uh, and it does not appear to be either accidental or incidental that they are all to a one without remedy, even in the cases of the children, seven years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old, right? No one is to blame. Um, and so there was this, you know, in the past, in the intervening years, people repeatedly said, well, the witnessing of footage would change the nation. But the problem wasn't that people didn't care, it was that they didn't know. Um, and so there was a, 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 a repeated visual, um, a cyclical visual on corporate news sites of um, death. Um, but the past two years haven't borne that out. In fact, um, what they um, have borne instead is a president-elect um, uh, of the sort that we have. One of the things I noticed um, last year uh, oh, actually, earlier this year, is that oftentimes, you know, that I have cycles of um, harassment on social media. Uh, much of it is misogynistic. It's interesting. It's the one arena in which I get more um, hostility on the basis of gender than race. Um, uh, and um, so I began to notice early this year that oftentimes um, those who would call me, um, you know, cunt, bitch, et cetera, et cetera, had Trump logos. Um, on uh, the the tops of their um, of their Twitter profiles, or I also had people who uh, of this sort who would attempt to call me on Facebook, and you can call people on Facebook, and um, and if they couldn't because they couldn't reach me because I didn't answer the phone from strangers, would say you know things about Trump, and also in addition to all of these um, slurs, um, and what it indicates, right, is that. Um, uh, these, you know, this um, rise of a kind of um, um, celebratory, old-fashioned forms of bigotry um, uh, goes along with this conception amongst those who um, believe those things, uh, have those values that, that the president-elect is both their champion and their hero. Um, his appointments suggest that he's not, in fact, their hero, that he, um, but that rather the sort of vitriolic bigotries um, while uh, something that he feeds off of or, or not, he doesn't indicate, there's no suggestion that he's actually gonna operate um, with the interests of, as um, the media has, has now um, dis rediscovered the category working class in the society, and particularly <laughs> a white working class, it's, fa it's fascinating. Um, uh, but what's, fas what, what's also an interesting dimension of this is in, in light, and this sort of um, goes back to the previous panel, right? The, 
in light of uh, the precarity that goes along with neoliberal forms of governmentality, um, what is being exchanged is a promise of old-fashioned conventional forms of hierarchies, of race, of gender, of sexuality, such that the, market com the frame of market competition will at least be narrower. There will be some people who will be entirely pushed out um, of, of the frame. Um, um, so what, um, so his agenda is something more than a nationalist one. It is in some ways a social Darwinistic one um, in which accumulation and exploitation are virtues. Um, and rather than interdependence, we ought to be, the, what's promised is that we ought to be locked in a battle royale with everyone in our midst um, for spoils. Um, and so um, I do think art matters now a great deal, but what I keep, I actually, it's interesting because I keep going back to the past and in response to the question, um, I immediately thought of, and I, it actually wasn't, it was less a thought, it was more of a kind of um, an emotional response. I thought about um, uh, Yuzan Palsy's Sugarcane Alley, which I saw as a child in the theater. And the film had um, an immediate resonance for me um, in part because it was filled with brown children like me. Um, uh, it took place um, in the 1930s, and so there was a resonance with my, my um, grandmother's generation. She was, uh, grew up in a, an agricultural context in rural Alabama. This was Martinique. Um, uh, uh, but like the children in the film who sat at elders' knees and heard stories of the old days, um, I did the same. Uh, like me, they were children who were caught in the interstices of legacies of colonial domination, exploitative labor relations, and racism. Um, and yet watching the film and reading subtitles, they were speaking French instead of English. Um, so there's this, there's, there was this uh, repetition of similar circumstances um, and also uh, res a re realization of um, the satellites of empire that are shared. Um, so it was uncanny, right? So um, both incredibly familiar and unfamiliar. And so I, 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 I think that film is important in this moment because we have to reckon with the fact of our world. And so not just the immediacy of the threats to us as individuals, but global systems of power, inequal, unequal distributions of risk and of suffering domestically and internationally. And I think that part of what the moment occasions is, you know, if we see the moment as a reckoning, um, is an opportunity for, for thinking about the ways that art can do this for us, um, that it can move us, and that we, in fact, uh, there's an imperative that we are moved. Um, if we take advantage of the opportunity of the moment, I think it will produce an urgency far greater than what's going to happen at the midterm elections um, and who gets more seats um, and, 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 and perhaps make us actually witness um, Aleppo in Haiti in a moment like this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the um, I had a, have a few images. So the, um, the Roy de Carve, it's a 1949 photograph um, called Graduation. Um, and, the re the, the, um, and this, is, uh, this image resonates for me um, because the dynamic relationship between the kind of care and celebration that's evidenced in her adornment and the ruins um, and uh, uh, sort of the, the cutting into the decay of the city, but also um, a posture of, res of, of resistance that comes through care um, is something that DeCarve, I think, captures beautifully here. Um, it's in Harlem. And then the, the next um, image um, uh, is a 1956 image in Shady Grove, Alabama, taken by Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks um, wrote a bunch of memoirs, I think there are five, and most of them begin in Alabama, which is fascinating because he's from Kansas, but there's something about the experience in Alabama, and of course, you know, my, my, I was born in Alabama, so there's a, there's a, a, a kind of personal resonance, but um, uh, I think, you know, I think sort of part of what, what our fear in this moment, right, is the closing of the doors. These are children who are looking in on a fair that's segregated that they can't um, uh, participate in. Um, 
Uh, and at the same time, again, um, we can see how the children are attended to. So actually, one of the things, and I've talked about this with Arthur J. Frey and with Fred Moten, the, the question, can blackness be loved, troubles me, because who is the question being posed to? Because these children are loved, I was loved, I, it's loved, right? It's just to whom, you know, that, that, that. The orientation of the question actually um, presumes that some, that the question is more s important for some than others. So the care um, that is uh, evidenced in the adornment of these children who are excluded from the society, um, uh, I think is, a, is, is, instruct, is instructive for this moment. And then the last image I have, and I'm gonna end quickly, is a, um, is a 19th century mugshot. Um, uh, and I love, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and there's this woman with this Gibson girl hairdo. Um, we don't know what she did. Um, uh, but again, I think it's, it's this sort of residence um, of attention to beauty under conditions of captivity, um, exclusion, and destruction. I think that there's something about beauty that ignites the imagination, the sense of possibility. Um, we have a lot of discourses of constraint in our political culture, but also in our, our social worlds. There's a lot of discussion about what can't be done. Um, and there's actually a lesson in the president-elect's complete lack of constraint. Um, he's not afraid to imagine um, a fascistic state um, and what in a kind of thoroughgoing architecture of exclusion and domination. But what if we who believe in freedom um, allowed our imaginations to be ignited and to imagine freely? What might we be able to do then? Oh, thank you. Great ending. Fabulous. 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 Um, Bo Williman um, agreed to come tonight as long as I didn't make him talk about television. And in fact, I want him to talk instead um, about this new political network that he's creating, co-creating. So, um, Bo Willman. Hi. Do you have a um, mic? Here, take a mic. I'm not going to use the mic. Um, so, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I am pulling kind of a Wait, fast hold one. They have to for the recording. For the technical recording. Sure. For posterity, use a mic. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to use a mic. Okay. I'm not going to use All a right. mic for part of this. I'm going to... And, and there's an important reason why. So I, yeah, I pulled a little bit of fast from here. I have nothing to offer on film or television tonight. Um, and I would ask, uh, while, I mean, th this is being recorded for posterity, I would ask that you don't record or take photographs during the next 10 minutes, during my, my 10 minutes with you. Because I actually want this moment for these next 10 minutes to be about this gathering of people in a physical space, sharing a present moment together. Mm -hmm. And that will get to what I've been up to over the past four weeks um, and, and, and why it's important to feel that. Now, I'll, I'll do this because they want me to. But um, the, the day of the election, I was in Miami of all places uh, because I was supposed to participate in a summit uh, the next day, which is a bunch of smart people getting together, doing keynotes and panels, events like this. Um, and I was supposed to do a presentation on the future of storytelling and content, blah, blah, blah. And I, I uh, called the founders of the summit that night uh, when it became clear who was going to win. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, I have to bail on the summit because I can't justify um, participating in the summit for three days when I can take a flight back to New York, immediately start making calls, activating my network. We have uh, you know, two and a half months until the inauguration, and we have one year, 364 days until the midterm elections. So I'm gonna bail, unless, unless I can reprogram part of this summit to gather some of the smart minds that will be there in a physical space like this, and we can immediately begin talking about concrete action items um, right away. They gave me the time and the resources to do that, and so my next three days became about organizing these action sessions. Uh, I said from the get-go during these sessions, which were under impossibly broad banners like social justice or climate or women's rights and health, but you know, th those were there to give some direction to discussion. I said, this space is not about processing or analysis or grief. There will be plenty of 
spaces to do that at the summit and elsewhere in your life. What this is about is concrete action. So if you have a concrete action that you want to offer, do so. Or if you have something you want to work on concretely, but you don't know how, bring it up and someone in this room may be able to give you some direction. Now, of course, the responses we got from people, the offerings of concrete action, were all over the place to start. They were a bit scattered. But what was happening in that room, far more important even than the concrete actions that were offered, were people who were gathered in a space, who were standing up and saying, looking each other in the eye with their physical presence, I commit to doing something, to taking my passion, my energy, my expertise, my money, whatever resources and time I can manage to actually do something. And when you do that in front of other people, and you know those people are saying and doing the same thing back to you in your presence, it creates a shared responsibility and peer accountability that will motivate and sustain your action over time. When I finished the summit, I thought, well, this was pretty productive. A lot of people had offered a lot of concrete stuff. A lot of people had made connections and partnerships that they were going to move forward on together out of that summit. And I thought, well, what if I try to replicate this in other cities? So I started calling friends in my personal network. Uh, and I said, this is what I did at the summit. How about we do it in your town? The response was enthusiastic and unanimous. So I thought, well, what if I broaden this a little bit and encourage people in general through my means and social media um, and, and my very, 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 very minor celebrity uh, in terms of my ability to, to reach people, say, hey, I want folks out there to start forming action groups. Start gathering your friends, your family, and your colleagues right away. Pick something that you care about and commit to a concrete action that you can work on together. Within hours, I was being flooded by responses across the country. Within a couple days, I had heard from thousands of people within 50 states uh, in over 150 cities who wanted to form action groups. It very quickly got to an influx that I couldn't imagine, uh, uh, manage on my own, so I, I began to hire uh, full-time staff uh, to help me organize and to help me administrate all of this. Um, in the past four weeks, uh, we have begun to do outreach to every single person in the country that's reached out to us that said they want to form an action group uh, to help give them basic tr training and a toolkit to organize uh, in their area. Um, we, we envision these action groups and, and really what the way they're meant to function is that these are groups of 10 to 50 people who gather either in a space like this or in someone's living room or after bowling on Tuesday nights, but on a regular basis with a group leader, they discuss the things that are important to them and then they proceed to act on them. And we will help give the resources and the training that they need. We will also be able to link larger organizations that have been fighting the good fight for decades to these organized groups on the ground. In our network, we will be able to connect these groups to one another, also to other pre-existing organizations, both on the local and national level. The groups will be able to communicate. They will be able to share resources. And if you're someone in the suburbs of Akron, Ohio, who's never been politically active in your life, Life, but you feel the need to get involved, then you can find us, you can look at Ohio, you can go to Akron, you can go, oh look, there's four groups that are in Akron, Ohio, working on X, Y, Z, and Omega. Omega floats my boat, I'll have a contact, in for, uh, contact for that group leader, I'll be able to contact that person and immediately become part of a group. Now, why did I not want to speak with the microphone? Maybe it's because I came out of the theater, and when I speak like this, my voice is going directly from my lungs and my diaphragm through the air into your eardrum. We are sharing the same air molecules. That sounds pretty new agey, but it's actually a physical, it's a physical and chemical reaction that is happening right now that cannot be replicated because it is these people in this room at this moment breathing this air, feeling these things. And when you can belong to a group of people from your community, a small group of people, you have a sense of belonging, shared responsibility, and peer accountability that is not the same as signing up for your monthly donation to the ACLU. And it is something that the left has failed on in the past three decades, which is organizing room by room on the ground. And you gotta roll up the sleeves and you gotta do it and it's gotta be room by room. Now, I, 
have been to seven states in the past three and a half weeks. I have done meetups in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, St. Louis, Charlotte, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, Santa Fe. I'm going to Baltimore on Saturday. And what is incredibly important about the sort of you know, decentralized approach that we're taking of groups determining for themselves what they care about is that one, their skin has to be in the game, and two, you cannot create a grassroots movement from the top down. You can't do it with, me with top down messaging. You can't do it by anticipating what you think people want to hear. You actually have to go and talk to them and you have to listen. And to give you a sense of how complex our country is right now, if you weren't already aware, um, you know, I've sat down in rooms with people that are as radical and subversive as you could possibly imagine on the left. But also, I'm living in a world where the woman who helped me organize the meetup in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was a room of 200 liberal people, more or less, that believed Dr Donald Trump was a fascist demagogue, she voted for Trump. This is a college-educated professional woman who, if you asked her what her reasoning was for why she voted for Trump, a decision she agonized over, um, you will hear an argument that might not be your math, but is also not a stupid argument. She would hold up in debate class. And when I said, why are you helping me organize a group of 200 liberals in Charlotte, North Carolina, who think the man you voted for is a fascist demagogue? She said, well, I don't think he's as scary as you do, and I don't think he's gonna do all the things he claimed he would during his campaign bluster phase, but I am pro-choice, despite the fact that I'm deeply conservative, and my brother-in-law, yeah, look, we can roll our eyes and we can laugh, but this is, yeah, yeah. But, but, the, 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 but her brother-in-law is also the son of undocumented immigrants, and she said, if Trump comes after Roe v. Wade, or starts to pursue draconian immigration policy, I don't want to see that happen. And if you're gathering a bunch of people, even if they're liberal, who will work towards safeguarding those two things, I find that to be a value. And her father, a staunch conservative also, paid for the neighborhood theater where we all met. That's extraordinary to me because, yes, we must resist and we must also understand that there are people like this woman in Charlotte, North Carolina, who while we might disagree with her on 85% of the things that we would discuss, there is an asset there, there is a resource there, there is someone that we can at least on those two issues pull into the fold and who committed time, money, and resources to organizing a room of people that look like this. So, <clears throat> I've had the great pleasure over the last several years of serving on the Writers Guild of America East Council uh, with Walter Bernstein, um, a man who at the young age of 97 has seen a lot, um, has survived a lot, has suffered and seen others suffer because of regimes like the one we are about to endure. And what he said tonight, in which you've heard almost, you know, all of us echo in one way or form or another, uh, is that, it, it, you know, and you're hearing this from a couple guys who make their living writing words uh, in, the, in the realm of make-believe, uh, you know, we, we agonize over the words that we write. We bang our head against the wall in terms of the words that we write, but he said it at the beginning of the night, do not mistake words for action. And so while I make a living uh, as a writer, uh, more important than that, uh, I'm a person who lives in a community that is a country. Um, I was going to say I'm a citizen, but you don't need to be a citizen to care about this country. Uh, and, and I think it's very important as we consider what happened, what history tells us, what we can learn from it, what we can process and experience emotionally and intellectually through our art as we look for ways to tell stories moving forward, we don't lose sight of this simple fact that it requires bodies in a room and sometimes bodies in a state house and sometimes bodies on a street and it requires the actual physical meeting of people and at times physical resistance in order to combat 
what we have coming down the pike in a few short weeks. So I'm here not tonight uh, to recruit <laughs> and to organize. And there's 100 people in this room. And I'm going to give you a direct action that you can walk away with tonight. So I asked you to put all your phones away. Now I want you to all take them out. All right? Take them out. Take your phones out right now. If you don't have a phone, you have a piece of paper and a pen. This is what I'm going to end with. Um, <clears throat> all of you know someone that does not live in New York City. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I went for the holidays, and it's, it's a different world. And many of you come from parts of the country that are not Los Angeles or New York City, or you have family members there, or someone you went to school with lives there. And what I want you to do right now is write down the name of at least one of those people. I'm gonna bring these people up while you're doing this. Yep. Write, write down that name, please. Type it into your phone. Email it to yourself. And I want you to commit that within 24 hours, you're gonna call that person. You're not gonna text them, you're not gonna email them, you're not gonna message them on Signal or Facebook. You're going to actually call that person, whether they're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or upstate New York, or whether they're in Memphis, Tennessee, or whether they're in a rural community in Idaho. And you're going to ask them what this election has meant to them. You're going to ask them what their concerns are about the world that we're about to em em embark upon uh, January 20th. And you're going to listen. And then you're going to ask how you can help. One of the major things I've experienced is I've made my way around the country, particularly in places like Texas and North Carolina uh, and New Mexico, is there's a lot of the country that feels like the people in this room don't give two shits about them, that we don't understand or listen to them. And you cannot fight your enemy unless you understand them. And you'll often find that sometimes among your enemies are allies. So you can begin the process within 24 hours, if you haven't already, of getting to know your enemy slash ally and maybe also finding a concrete way that you can be of help elsewhere in the country besides the cushiony New York City that we live in where 90% of the people on this island didn't vote for Trump because there are pl people you know in places for whom it was the other way around and we need to be in touch and working with those people too. That's it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. We still have some time. I got everybody back up here. And uh, we can talk among ourselves and we can talk with you. And um, listening to Bo and listening to these calls for action and listening to a lot of the analysis that we've heard tonight, um, you know, it reminded me of something I've been thinking about, which is this whole question of f fake news and how to know what to trust and how to know what we're reading and even to the point where people on Facebook are correcting each other like take that down that's not real what's your source and then at the same time you know have putting things up that are real and having them ignored because people may not believe them and I started thinking I wish we could have you know some kind of watermark I wish we could have something like uh, you know in the 1950s the Ladies Home Journal used to give a seal of approval to products that you could trust, you know, or the underwriter's laboratory would put UL on an electrical appliance and then you knew it wouldn't explode when you plugged it in or, or some kind of symbol for halal or for kosher. So I need some kind of symbol like that um, going online or looking on screens to know this is tr uh, trustworthy. Like where's Where's, where's my, uh, my group, where's my meeting, you know, for that? That's, that's what I would go for. But we've heard a lot about contradiction. We've heard about amnesia. We've heard about trauma and memory, um, about questions of address, who is included in questions, who is not, who is being addressed, who is being spoken on behalf of or for, um, who is here, who's out there, who are we, who are they? Um, and what happens under these different regimes, the kinds of stories that um, Walter brought, that Natalia and Susana brought, that Angela brought, um, the kind of examples that Michael was giving. Um, I want to hear what you have to ask. I want to hear what panelists have to say to each other. We have a little bit of time left. Um, I think it's been incredibly inspiring. I want to keep that going. Yeah. Do you need 
And uh, let the mic come to you and identify yourself so we know who's talking. Yeah. Okay, my name is Lynn miller Lockman, and I blog about a lot of these issues. I also spend part of my year in Portugal, and I have been to the Museum of, um, of Resistance, and definitely recommend anybody who goes to Lisbon um, go to the Resi Museum of Resistance and Liberation. Uh, but one of the interesting things about that museum and of my own um, research into the history of Portugal is the way that um, the movement was so clandestine and how people really had to hide. Um, and there were very small cells of people who were able to act because, you know, if one of the cells was arrested, um, that it wouldn't be everybody who was in resistance in that neighborhood or in that city who um, would be arrested. And Walter, um, I really appreciated your presentation to Walter Bernstein about um, the whole issue of the blacklist and you could get off the blacklist by giving names. Well, now we get to this organization, Bo Wilman, that you started. And nowadays, we don't need to have to hide or we don't know how to hide. And the authorities don't need a blacklist or torture because you can just go on to Twitter or Facebook. How do you deal with that if we're going to be resisting a police state? Well, I think there's a question for anybody up here. Yeah, Ruth. Well, but there's there there may not. Who knows? Well, Newt Gingrich was calling already for some form of uh, new House and American activities. But Trump has been training uh, various constituencies for some time, and one thing he started to do was with the press. He's denying access. He did it selectively, and then the whole you know. Uh, authoritarians are very into spatial politics, right? So the way he set up his rallies where the press was put in a pen and they were slowly, you know, the, it was very interesting because plenty of people in America already hated African Americans, they already hated Hispanics, and but some of them were taught to hate the mainstream press to a degree they hadn't hated before. So he put them in a pen which criminalized them. So denying access selectively and then to entire media units was a first form of doing this kind of thing. And then we don't know what else will evolve. Would you like? Uh, as I understand it, you were saying that uh, if somebody signs up for Bo's organization or whatever, uh, they're going to know about it. The authorities are going to know about it. Of course, they're going to know. They know about it anyway. I'm, you know, uh, there's very little, if anything, of you that's still secret. You know, and uh, at the moment, you know, we don't have the necessity to hide. Uh, perhaps it may come, and if it does, uh, knowing how to hide or learning how to hide comes fairly easy. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find out soon enough how to do it. Yeah. And, and don't forget, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, there's, there's always this drive to claim a kind of heroism in advance of action also. And I would just say that, you know, you, you'll, there's a long ways to go before they're going to be after many of us. And let's, let's do something to, to warrant that first, you know. And, mm -hmm. and also, it, also, you know, I, I did anti-Cuba work in the 1970s. I was threatened with libel suits. I had letters to editors denouncing me as a foreign agent. I had the Center for Constitutional Rights defending me. And when I picked up my phone in Chicago to make a call, I'd hear the two guys talking on the phone who were bugging my line. I said, would you please hang up? I got to make a call. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like this is this giant monster behind the screen. Yes, you figure out how you're going to move through that. And, you know, and then you figure out what you can do. I'm more concerned with what we can do that's effective than what's going to stop us. I'll just put that out there. Maybe, yeah. Maybe just one last yeah. Uh, wait, you need a mic. Where's the mic at that end? Should be on the f floor. Oh. Yeah. 
um, that has come up and that I feel most uh, crucial and important right now, and it's the question of trying to uh, beforehand generate sanctuary spaces and so many people involved in education, whether it's a high school and elementary or college level or community colleges, because there are there's such an enormous amount of uh, people in this country, not only through the DACA program, but ev even outside of the DACA program, that enter into pre-forms of citizenship and just belonging through public education, and those people are terrified right now. Mm -hmm. And so, so many campuses, university campuses across the US have started these petitions, sending to their chancellors, their presidents, like we want to become sanctuary campuses. We need to be, and this is a question of action, we need to be educated by lawyers who have been working on this issue because we're all signing these petitions, but what exactly does that mean? Like, mm -hmm. do, is it possible for any of these physical spaces, which are schools, which are universities, to become places where these uh, children, students, and their families, because that's the problem, is that all these schools, even if they resist not giving up their names, all their files contain the information and all these, you know, thousands, probably millions of undocumented families that will get deported. Um, I think the sanctuary movement, though, um, as someone who works inside a university, it also serves another, it serves another purpose, in a sense. Um, you know, apropos of, of flying something and see who, who, who lines up where, this is the way that you do find out in something fairly innocent, where nothing is at stake really for people personally, whether or not they're going to back this. And you really find out mm -hmm. an aspect of, of you know, where people are going to stand. You can encourage people to take this small step. This is a small step. This is a harmless step to speak up for this and to get together and do this as a community, mm -hmm. you know, so. And the, just for a foot, just sanctuary, a foot, yeah. uh, sanctuary campuses and city movement is well underway. Uh, you know, student organizations, obviously, you know, they, they, you got that young, that young blood uh, jumping into the mix pretty quickly. So you've started to see that on campuses. But for instance, I was speaking to a city council member of Santa Fe um, a few days ago. Tomorrow, the city council of Santa Fe will introduce resolutions to make Santa Fe a sanctuary city. Uh, and they're already looking at how they're going to uh, deal with uh, federal funding being taken away from them if Trump follows through on his threat, not that he's empowered to, but Congress is, uh, to take away federal funding. They, they, were, they are going to look at the budget and how they will cope with that and telling their citizens, we're still going to provide the services we need to provide you, um, even if we don't get federal dollars. Uh, and I was speaking to an attorney general of a state, which I can't mention here publicly, uh, who said that lawyers are already looking into the loopholes that can prevent the federal government from actually taking away federal funds. But the fact that a city, an actual municipal government, is willing to say we are willing to relinquish federal funds to make this public sta mm -hmm. statement as a municipality and as your elected officials mm -hmm. is exactly the sort of pressure points that we can put on communities around the country where people on a local level can be lobbying their city councils, their county commissions or county boards uh, uh, to to follow a model resolution to become a sanctuary city. And if you don't do it, then you will get punished at the ballot box. Um, so, so these are the sort of actions that one can take. Also, I just want to add to that, don't underestimate the symbolic significance of these cultural spaces, like the one that we're sitting in now. You know, I'm so grateful to Eugene and Dennis, Brian and, and Lisa for opening up uh, Film Study Lincoln Center for us to be meeting here now. And yeah, and I told a Cuba story from the past, but I didn't mention the footnote. Lincoln Center was bombed for having a Cuban dance company appear here. That happened. We're talking about memory and amnesia. Mm -hmm. That happened right here in New York. Film Forum had to hire 24-hour security guards when they did a, screen, a, a series of Cuban films. The Cuban right wing was bombing airlines and killing people and going unpunished. So 
these cultural spaces also need to be claimed, defended, used, and appreciated as we march forward into this new period with all kinds of organizing. Don't, f don't forget about them, too. Yeah, we've got some questions out here. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is Jim Forat, and uh, I just want to remind people, too, that the mayor of New York City marched into one of the larger spaces here at Lincoln Center and pulled out the Palestinian leader who was sitting watching a concert, took him out. And that caused a lot of pushback. I just, I work with a group called Gays Against Guns that came out after the Pulse shooting. It's an inclusive, it's not an exclusively gay organization, it's inclusive of multi-issues. And we have talked a lot about what do we do now. And one of the things that we, we felt is, within our own group, by talking about how we were feeling, is that people were afraid the, the, the kind of manipulation of fear that the campaign and the media has created, how do you deal with fear? So one of the, our actions has been, one of our affinity groups, is that we're going around town singing Christmas carols that we have rewritten with very radical messages within them to give people, and asking people to come and join us and sing along with us so that there, this, we're working against this normalization, number one, and number two, we're doing it openly as people from an organization called GAG, or G Gays Against Guns, to say that identity politics does not, there's a real attack on identity politics now, and some of it for very legitimate reasons. But the reality is, when you know who you are, which was what the basics of identity politics from my generation was about, you can then look and sit in a room, be in the same boat with lots of other people who are looking at who they are, and we have to find out what we have in common. Everyone doesn't have to do the same action. That's what's really good about this action network idea. Figure out what you want to do and find those friends or new friends that want to do the same thing. It's, there's many fingers on, a, on, the, on the fist or the hand of resistance, and just do that. And be not afraid, we live in this intensely surveilled society. One of the things that we're doing is not being afraid to show our faces, knowing full well how that can be dangerous. But just fuck it, you know, we cannot, all live underground, and those people that want to live underground and those people that want to organize that way, I say, good speed. But we want to be very public in this resistance, and we want to be very diverse in who we are. And we don't all have to work together. We don't have to all love each other. But, but we're, we're looking at, I'm a white gay man. I'm trying to look at how do I not dominate this meeting? How do I not, you know, because of the privilege and the skills that I might have verbally, how do I not do that in the larger world outside? And, and this goes way back to the early days of, of organizing the gay liberation fronts and the, women, the tools that women brought in from women's liberation. Everyone has a voice. Help them find it. Great. Thank you, Jen. Down here, Regina. We got one right here. Yeah. Um, my question is for Natalia. Um, you expressed some ambivalence about the, um, the efficacy of political cinema today. I was wondering what your opinions on, on the weakness of kind of revolutionary aesthetics of European or American avant-garde is today. And then you also mentioned a few films by like Pedro Costa, and I was wondering if you think that the future of political cinema is post-colonial and not the European avant-garde as it was 50 years ago. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I think that the, the failure of political, I mean, the, its gains, but also its long-term failure is, comes hand in hand with the failure of socialist revolutions of the 1960s or starting from the 1950s on, right? Meaning we live in this post-1989 world where you know, neoliberalism as the most recent form of capitalism has just become the norm 
everywhere in the world, right? Um, so, so that the failure of political cinema and, you know, its iteration in the 60s and 70s, I think is related to that other failure because that was what it was uh, coming with, you know? It was at the service of those social movements and those political revolutions. Um, and I think we're in a very different moment today, so that I think that also the very avant-garde aesthetic that was played out in most of the political cinema of the 1960s and 70s, and which, I mean, it's interesting, I, I don't think, when I think of that cinema, I think that it was a cinema coming out of Latin America, out of Africa, and out of Asia, but not necessarily um, out of the US and nor Europe, right? I mean, um, and I, yes, I mentioned Costa and, and I mentioned work like Susana's um, or work uh, like Paz Encinas. Um, and I do, I do think that it's, it's kind of the, the, the multiple uh, uh, practices and aesthetics of the post-colonial you know, and post-colonial and sometimes ex-third world, we don't call it that anymore, right? Um, uh, but I still use that term because I think it refers uh, easily to the vast majority of the world today. Um, <laughs> still, we need, so, we need and I new think, words. <laughs> yeah, mm. and I, in few words, and I think that that is where that cinema is coming from and that it's a lot of collective work being done, um, yeah. But I think it's it's different it, it in in as much as it's collective work or it's historical work in the way the kind of historical work that someone like Susana the other Pasencina in Paraguay, um, working through archives that have been repressed and that have much to teach us in how we engage and we activate. We don't only contemplate, but we activate those archives, which is what you know the work of someone like Susana is doing. Um, that is where we will learn our lessons, but those are, they're not going to necessarily be high modernist lessons. They're, they're the lesson of high modernism in film, but that has passed through television, that has passed through, you know, the emergence of digital culture. I wish sometimes that there were things like Netflix series being done in the third world, but we, there, is th there, there is no resource to do that kind of work. Right, because I, I, I'm saying that I wish because I, it would be interesting to see what a, that kind of storytelling, right, a, in the way that it has taken on a, f uh, a, a political message here in the U.S. That kind of new serial, a, you know, a television. A but that that th th there is no material structure for that in 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 Latin America or in the post-colonial world. So I do think that it's out of these more film collective practices where they, they decide on their aesthetic and that's why I think there's multiple forms of it, right? But it is the return of history, whether it's post-colonial or you know, otherwise. Mm. Um, yeah, go yeah on, go to just go ahead and add to that, I mean, I would, this question of the failure of a political cinema here in the context of, say, the history of American film, um, I think you really might want to think about revisiting the L.A. Rebellion, uh, because what you're talking about in terms of a failure of political cinema, to me in some ways is more through a more prescriptive lens of an immediacy of, okay, I've done this film and then it's going to affect some kind of causality of immediate change. I don't think that you can apply that to something like the L.A. Rebellion, which to me is the most exquisite measure of a kind of black and perfect cinema, which is also a kind of exquisite measure of thinking of, you know, Bob Stam talks about this, of this idea of third and the first, of third cinema being animated in a first world context. So. I would really, you know, I, if you're not familiar with the LA Rebellion, I strongly encourage you to think about There's that in book. terms. There's a new book. There's a new book. I would revisit the UCLA Archive Project. I would actually even look at the program that was here at Lincoln Center on Tell It Like It Is, of looking at black independent cinema in New York City. I think you might want to kind of broaden your measure of what might constitute a political cinema. Is okay. Because there's, I think it's still alive and well particularly in the context of thinking about the idea of black film. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Hey guys, so I, um, I'm Olivia Harris, or Olivia Gray, um, and I'm 23. I recently graduated college, thank God. And um, I've noticed a really interesting thing going around with my peers, people my age, people I went to school with, people who are, didn't go to college and don't, I studied international affairs, so I kind of have a very particular view of the world. And so when I see in them and, and I go to the protests, especially minorities, whether you're black, Spanish, or you know, Chinese, you know, a, any type of Asian, there's so much anger and so much hatred. Um, I just recently went to a um, protest um, against the shooting. It was another young black kid got shot and it was, I think it was like the latest protest where hundreds and like thousands of people went to the streets and it was the most beautiful thing because every time I turned around it was somebody of a different color and somebody who was just so passionate about you know what was going on and then I stepped back and it was we were in Times Square and these two people were arguing against a cop saying oh we're gonna shoot you we're gonna do this to you and there's there's such an interesting juxtaposition when you take individualities based on you know different cultures but also based on different professions and then it, based on different um, ethnicities and, and you try to say oh we want to stand up for our own rights we want to stand up for our own freedoms and then you have the backlash which we've seen with supporters of Trump who say well okay what about us we want to stand up for our own rights too and so I think um, with that juxtaposition in you know individualness, individuality. I, I want to think that there's a possibility that there, a, a, a hand can be reached across the table from minorities and people who look like me, people who look nothing like me, and we can say, hey, let's talk about it. But when I talk to my friends and when I talk to other people who don't necessarily have the outlook on the world that I do, they say, no, what are we gonna talk to them for? We're tired of being shot and killed in the streets for no reason. We're tired of this, we're tired of that. And I think what a beautiful thing that a film that I've been seeing in art is that just like the humanity, like Moonlight, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like, I know, right? I need to run, I need to run and go see it. But like the, the beauty of, of showing humanity in somebody who is portrayed in the media as a as a, um, um, like a, what's the word? As, 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 a, as um, an enemy, in a sense, in a way. And to, to show the humanity in that, and I, I have so much, you know, in what Bo and, and Imani, what you guys were saying about, you know, being able to reach across the table, being able to, to get that perspective, I have so much hope in that. But I, I kind of want to pose the question and, you know, see your opinion on, is there actually any hope in that? And I feel like there, there is, but at the same time, Trump just yeah. won. <laughs> yeah, so I, one of the, uh, there's a lot of righteous rage, right? There's a reason to be angry. Um, and one of the things that I, um, my immediate reaction frequently, because there's also a lot of criticism of modes of protest, um, which are often about tone and language and gesture when we're talking about death, right? So that the attention, that for the attention to focus on um, the performance of rage um, actually pivots our attention. And, and my, my child who's in eighth grade had this, he said, he came back home and he said, oh, all these people in my class say Black Lives Matter is violent. And I said, well, the premise of the organization is the ending of violence, right? That's a very, but, um, and so what you're really talking about for the most part is, a, is, is um, an effort to regulate language, to, e to regulate expressions of rage. Um, and the reason that I think that's troubling is that despite the fact that it's so common, it's so frequent that people say uh, rioting and rage and, and angry protests or destruction of property don't produce anything, history actually shows that's not true. Um, the quote unquote riots, the rebellions, produced integration in higher education. It didn't happen after the marches in Selma. It happened after people were burning streets, right? Um, the diversification of the media 
black people being on television for the first time. That's a response, right? So um, uh, the shift in the political landscape, all these things. So um, it's hard. To, so I think the question has to be posed is in a different way, which is, does it take this mm -hmm. to have people respond, right? The question should be, why does it take this, mm -hmm. right? Why does the reaching of the hand across the aisle not work, right? Mm -hmm. That's the question. You know, and I don't, I don't think that, I don't, I'm not hopeless, but I think that that's a moral question that has to be posed to this country writ large, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's my turn. Right here. Right. And then we have to close I'll talk fast, sorry. <laughs> you know what, what I'd like to do is take a number of these questions and then let the panel answer. So if you can just be to the point, I wanna hear if there's a lot of people here waiting to speak, so let's do that. Yeah. But I should... Go ahead, yeah. Okay. The question I have, which is a concern for those of us who are filmmakers and media makers, is, is um, it's, it's one thing to sort of make work um, in this time. And sometimes the work is small and meant to be immediate, you know, and meant to elicit action. And then there's work that's more of a, like a full-length film that's more reflective, maybe something like Raoul Peck's recent film, which I highly recommend. Um, what are the thoughts on terms of distribution? Because, you know, when a lot of these films were made, you know, it, there weren't that many filmmakers, it, you know, and now we're dealing with a, a very saturated media world. Um, and also a world where so much of the way we distribute things, which has been very effective, like on Facebook and other platforms, is someone else's platform that we don't have control over and can easily be clamped down. Um, so are there are thoughts from anyone on the panel about yeah. the challenges of distribution and, um, and ways of affecting change through our arts. Good. We're going to hold that, and we're going to keep going, and then get more, get more answers. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. <coughs> My name is Rafiq Gathwari. I'm an American Muslim, and I'm also the first non-Irish recipient of the Patrick Kavanaugh Poetry Award. Um, I'm gutted that no one talked about Islamophobia. However, uh, my friend Tabishtin is a British Muslim. And however, I'm trying, this is, uh, this is um, uh, pointed to Bo Williams. I just followed you on Twitter. I'm Brown Pundit on Twitter. And I'm trying to work with the Poetry Society of America downtown to organize Muslim poets, American Muslim poets, so that we can take that program forward. And I think hearing you tonight, being inspired by you tonight, I think they're going to need your pep talk down there, and I'm going to contact you for that. Thank you. Great, thank you. The, the mics are somewhere out there. Just speak if you have, and we're going to keep going so we can address a lot of these before we get out. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm Shilpa, I'm a filmmaker. I, I'm not sure if this is a question, but I mean, I'm South Asian. I literally grew up in New York and New Jersey, and I didn't realize it till later, but we were one of the first families to integrate the suburbs. <laughs> and like, people used to throw bricks at our windows. So I really wasn't surprised when Donald Trump won. It's like, those people didn't go away. Mm -hmm. Some of their kids I went to school with and were arguing with me on Facebook every time I would put a joke up about him. And we went through this after 9-11, which is going back to your point. You know, I was asked, are you supporting terrorism for wanting to show like anti-hate crimes videos? We were, two and I were working together at Center for Asian American Media, which is a division of PBS. The wars were starting, like were they gonna lose their funding? You know, we've been through all this before. We formed our own spaces and collectives, and election night, I was with some friends who were like, this is exactly like 9-11, we have to, you know, a lot of us have grown out of that, people have had kids now, or some people were actually invited to the White House like 15 years later after being <laughs> secretly underground and like doing organizing work all these years, you know, and I don't know what the answer <laughs> is to any of this, you know. But yeah, it's very frustrating to keep going through these cycles again and again. 
I, I, let's have one or yeah, these two hands back here. If you would just pass the mic back behind you, if you could do that right to there. And uh, let's hear from the two of you, and then we're going to let the panel have some last words. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Shoshana Vogel. I live on Staten Island. Um, spent probably the last 12 years as an activist in, on the West Coast. Came back home, and Staten Island's rough. Um, I appreciate all of you so much for being here and everybody in the audience. What you're saying, I'm feeling you, because I grew up, it made me the activist that I've always been, because I grew up in the midst of severe hate, severe. I mean, my brother got his head bashed in by the principal of my school in elementary school. The principal did that. But, you know, I felt like, okay, I knew that authority was not for me early. And it was a weird kind of a blessing because I knew what I had to fight always. Just intuitively, I always knew that there was hatred. And so I wasn't surprised either. And um, even kind of offended at some people's shock and newfound guttedness. Because for the last, since 2012, since I came back to New York, I've been so, I mean, really since 2014, but just shut down. So shut down. I've been a fighter my whole life and so shut down because Eric Garner took care of me. He was my neighbor around the corner. And every time I would go to the bus, he looked out for me in ways my dad never did. You know, the, my dad is not black, but you know, like Eric knew that we, we, we stand for each other. And when they killed him, I just like, I was just done. And I never thought that that would happen to me. So it's okay, I'm coming back, I'm good. That wasn't, there's other personal things in my family that made that happen. But I'm just reminded about the potential for fear. And so I always thought of myself as fearless and I know that I am, despite this wake up, even for me, about that. So I'm just grateful for everyone to be here and for the inspiration that you have and it feels good to actually put my voice amongst yours, so thank you. Hi, I'm short, so I'm gonna stand up. My name is Anjanette Levert, and I run the documentary forum at City College of New York. And so what I'm hearing, like what I'm just hearing right now is the fatigue that people of color who are filmmakers, media makers, and also um, attempting to actually do the news are, you know, just like this woman said, done. And now to like be in this kind of climate right now where diversity, like everyone's warning diversity. Oh, we just came to the party, although we've been here for this whole time. So I think that I'm looking at how I can help the people who come to my organization and the people who are looking to get into, um, into creating, um, I kind of think of it as this is an opportunity to document because so much of our histories were not documented previously, but what else can be done? Because in a way, I also think that just anything that, is, that we create in and of itself is political. So I'm looking at, okay, what, you know, people are coming together, you know, because of the, um, because of what I do, people are looking to me as kind of like, okay, a leadership thing. What, what should we be doing? So I am also interested in hearing from this, especially because we have a history that's already preceded us. And so now what can we do to kind of um, circumvent that? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're gonna just hear from the panel, have some last words before we move out of here. Um, I know everybody wants to say something, so I, mean, I, I teach documentary at UC Santa Cruz and work with all these kids who want to try to change the world with documentary and try to bring people's stories out. And I, my, I agree with the question about distribution. How can we get this work to people? Is film really an empathy machine? Is that true? Or are people just turning the dial, you know? And what can we do to, you know, help people open their eyes? I think it's really important. So, Ruth? You sure you yeah, yeah, Walter? Yeah. I want to hear from you. Um, just quickly, I, I wanted to pick up on something um, that Imani said and was also echoed. Um, that I, I think that we're going to see the, the importance of being visible as a form of politics, and that could mean being in the street, being together in the room to, to see 
other bodies together. This is what Bo is talking about. But also, when you mentioned, Imani, that um, how African American communities started to record as witnesses what happened, this was kind of for white hegemonic, um, and, and it goes back to imperialist, you know, control of the gays. This was the end of the world. I mean, many, Obama was the end of the world, but, but this, was, this was something that was highly dangerous and needed to be taken care of in a, in a way. And you had this huge backlash arise to many things, but now we have Trump. And this kind of, when I talked about this aesthetic of menace, I really didn't mean it in a high intellectual manner, although I used the word aesthetic. It is, we are having intimidation at a grassroots level all the time. We, we also have it on Twitter. Um, we, we, if you write about Trump, and uh, you, you get tons of hate mail. Um, hate Twitter, you, people try to shut you down, right? So I think that being visible um, and thinking about what that means and not being living in fear and going out, and, and each person has their way of being visible. Some will, some will do what Bo is doing and be physically together. Some, maybe you can be visible through your pen and writing for certain places. Um, I like to write for CNN because I get, I, I reach America, a certain America. I get hate and nice letters from people all over the world and steel workers and it's not like writing for the New York Review of Books. It's a different thing. So that's all I wanted to say. This question of visibility uh, is going to be really key and, and the body. I'm really glad that Bo mentioned even with the mic. We, 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 have to re we have to remember that images begin and end and words begin and end with bodies. Mm -hmm. And assembly. Uh, so, in turn, by way of closing comments, I just want to run through this list. Um, I feel like the last two years, and Ruby and I have talked about this, there's been a lot of wonderful work that's being done, I think, that's adding a necessary complication to the way that we think of the capacity around the idea of black film. Francis Badomo's Everybody Dies, Anna Rose Holmer's The Fits, Jatovia Gary's An Aesthetic Experience, Raul Peck's I'm Not Your Negro, the work of Kevin Jerome Everson, the work of Terrence Nance, Josh Losey's Hunter Gatherer, Stephen Winter's Jason and Shirley, and Barry Jenkins' Moonlight. A primer. Um, I, I myself think about documentary from making a little bit myself and from being with people in China and here that do it and teaching about it. I've come to think of it more as an event than a thing, more as an occasion where people can come together for a particular kind of purpose. And I don't know if my opinion of this has been indeed infected by you know, the social media turn and, and the fact that we, you know, so everybody has a camera, everybody is now the, what, the citizen documentary you know, brigade and so forth. But actually, this is, this is not at all a bad thing. This is a wonderful thing. It's not everything. There, you know, but uh, there are virtuosos among us, virtuosi artists and makers. But, um, but treating, you know, the, the, the occasion for documentation as, as a kind of social possibility and a way of bringing people together in order to do it is something that um, we might want to really consider. Um, just a couple of quick things. One is um, I think it's important to keep in mind in this moment that the risk is not distributed equally mm -hmm. um, and that we need to do the work of not just um, sort of attending to our own risk, but, but, but really the situatedness of, of people who are in incredibly vulnerable positions. Um, uh, the second uh, piece of that is that there are people who have been doing organizing work for literally decades um, who uh, can teach a lot of us who have come, who are coming to it more recently. It's important to, to listen. Um, and the last thing, which is a piece of that, is a quote from Ida B. Wells, the people must know before they can act. It's really important to understand how power works, how systems work, 
um, there's an urgency to the moment, but um, an informed ur urgency is much more uh, meaningful and effective than one that is not. Um, I'll find you, sir, afterwards. We have an uh, Islamophobia action group already here in New York City and other organizations that we're working with on that front, so we'll talk. Um, and uh, I'll, don't, I'll... Don't use the mic, I can barely hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll... Uh, just, just two things. Uh, putting, putting my, my writer, filmmaker hat on for a second. Um, you know, in terms of visibility or distribution, I think visibility is a good way to put it. I mean, part of it is is knowing what you want to achieve. Now, there are some things that are are more propaganda, and I don't necessarily use that in a bad way. There's bad propaganda, and there's good propaganda. It's about getting to as many eyes as possible, um, and it tends to be cruder. Um, uh, but it, it serves a purpose. Then there's um, pieces of art that are uh, very complex and nuanced and may not find a big audience. Um, but that's okay because, you know, it's like what they say about the Velvet Underground, only a thousand people ever bought an album and then they all started bands, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah, so. So you might, you might make a film that only ends up in, in one small or two small film festivals uh, somewhere in the country, but for all you know, one of the people that watches it is going to be the President of the United States in 20 years, um, or is going to be someone who's inspired to become a filmmaker themselves who's making work that's reaching a lot more eyes. I mean, it's, it's all drops in a very big river, um, and every drop has equal weight in the sense that no, no one of them can comprise the river in and of itself. And then the other thing um, is I think that, you know, artists on all fronts, uh, whether it's writers or filmmakers or painters, photographers, musicians, what have you, um, have to be, you know, realize that in America up until this point, for a lot of artists, not all artists in America, um, you really haven't had to worry about personal safety or freedom. Um, to the degree that artists in other parts of the world have, where you could get uh, killed for the work that you do, and be prepared for, are you willing to take the risk to make art that could put you in danger? Um, and that's a valid question to ask yourself, and you might feel, you know, your family's too important to you for them to lose you, or to you, for you to be imprisoned, or for you to lose your job. Um, but I think that's a question that we should begin asking ourselves now in terms of where's your invisible line so that you're prepared to go all the way up to the edge of it. I, I just want to thank Ruby but, um, for bringing us all together and wanted to suggest that we all partake not only in action, very importantly, I agree, right, words aren't actions, but that we all also partake in some form of the study of the history of fascism all over the world, because we have a lot to learn. And there's already a lot of on people who have gathered online that are doing these um, kind of international reading groups on fascism, because we, we will be prepared for action. I think I have nothing more to, to add, but <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important to, to, well, not just make films, but to create these groups to discuss the films, to, to bring the experience of working and seeing and discussing together. I, I, I had the experience of being um, a director of a film festival in Lisbon, and we, we opened a new section, Cinema of Urgence, it's this kind of cinema that it's made by citizens. Er, every, everybody has a camera nowadays. But these films usually are seen by people together in front of a computer. So for us, it was very, very important to open this new section to bring these films that we don't know if we can call them cinematographic forms, mm -hmm. to bring them to, to a, a cinema. To, to a room mm. and to discuss them mm. all together, and I think this is films of, very of urgency. Is that what you said? Cinema yeah. of urgency. Urgency. It's yeah. great, Walter. I think that's a great idea, Walter. I think you wanted to say something. All right. uh, uh, I don't know how to uh, clean this up, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> It's a story about Senator Joseph McCarthy. And 
when he made his first speech about communists in government, it was just an ordinary speech he made, I think, in Pennsylvania. Uh, about 200 communists in the State Department, something like this, something like that. But it hit the papers immediately on the front page, his accusations. And he came down the next morning, and there was a bunch of reporters already waiting for him. And he was carrying a rolled up newspaper, and he held it up, and he said, fellas, you know what I got here? A sock full of shit. And I thought about that because it's what we're gonna get hit with, really. And I think it's very important we start learning how to deal with it. That's it. Well. Perfect ending. This is the start of trying to figure out how to deal with it. Um, let's keep it going. All of you up here in the panel, think about um, putting something into Film Quarterly. We'll start trying to jumpstart this conversation and keep it going. If you didn't get a journal, they're down here. And um, I can't say it's exactly a journal of urgency, but it's at least a journal that invites urgency among what it does. And you've been a terrific, terrific crowd here tonight. And I won't say audience. You've been much too active to say audience. But it's been a great experience. And I thank you for the faith that you all had in coming here and opening up to this opportunity and to what everybody's had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you.